Okay, dokey. Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming along today. I say coming along, uh, going to your computer. Um, so, I'll just give you a brief introduction. My name is Will. I work for the ESPC. I'm in the marketing team. Um, and I'm joined by Claire Flynn, uh, who is also in the marketing team. We have Paul DeMarco, who is uh, ESPC Mortgages, and our resident expert is uh, Andrew Diamond from Lindsay's. Um, so, these are the panelists today. Um, so I'll just talk you through what we'll be doing um, and, and what the format of the event uh, will be. So um, we're going to start off with Claire giving a market update for August. Um, so lots of interesting numbers in there. Uh, we're then going to move on to the pre-submitted questions. So um, we've we took them over the past uh, two weeks since we put uh, since we put the form live on the website. Um, we did have to collate some of them together because there's a few questions that were kind of similar. Um, uh, so if you don't hear your question asked precisely the way you, you, you put it in, um, don't worry, we, we probably will be getting to it. There were some questions that were um, very specific. Um, so uh, for, for those ones, we, I may get back to you individually um, if it's for, for a very niche case. Um, and then once we've got through that, and depending on time, we will uh, go to the live Q&A. So you guys should see... Um, there's a Q&A option um, on your screen. So if you want to ask any questions along the way, if you just put them in there um, or in the chat, but try and use a Q&A if you can, um, keep things simpler. Um, you, can, you can put them in there and uh, we'll, we'll try and get to them. And if you, if you don't get to today, as I said, I'll, I'll try and um, reach out to you individually. Um, so without any further ado, um, Claire, would you like to do with the, uh, go with the property update, please? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Will. Um, so looking back at August, uh, it was another exceptionally busy month for the Scottish property market. It was obviously the second full month uh, since restrictions were relaxed at the end of June. So we were still seeing uh, that sort of pent up demand uh, as a result of the lockdown restrictions playing out in the market. Um, and I'm just going to go through a few of the sort of key statistics that ESPC recorded that highlights this high level of activity. Um, a lot of the activity we're seeing is much higher than uh, than this time last year and also much higher than even sort of January, February of 2020 before the lockdown restrictions came into, came into place. Um, so the number of homes listed on ESPC in August in Edinburgh, the Lothians, Fife and the Borders was up 41% year on year. Uh, in Edinburgh, the number of homes listed was up 48% year on year. So a really big jump there in the number of uh, properties coming to market, which um, obviously that's a good thing for buyers because generally more homes on the market means more choice. Um, so, so positive there for buyers. But we're also seeing very high levels of buyer activity as well. Obviously, those looking to sell their home, quite a lot will be looking to buy another property. Um, and we are seeing a lot of uh, significant year-on-year -year increases in buyer interest um, measures that we monitor. So, for example, uh, the number of home report downloads on ESPC in August 2020 was up 58% uh, compared to last August. Uh, we also saw viewing requests increase by 220% year on year. So really significant jumps there in some of our buyer interest metrics. Um, we're also hearing from agents that it, even with uh, an increase in the number of homes coming to market, there is still, uh, because there's so much buyer interest, there is still a lot of competition for homes, for certain homes. Um, they're sort of reporting that homes are often selling quickly um, with a, and they're also often selling in excess of the home report valuation due to the high levels of interest in a lot of properties. Um, one way, one of the things that we did notice was a significant jump in the number of closing dates held in August. So in August 2020, there was a 70% year on year increase in the number of closing dates. Um, closing dates are an, a bit of an indicator of uh, competition in the market um, because they're generally only um, held when there's been one or more notes of interest in a property. Um, so, so that has been a big jump there and does sort of highlight some of the, some of the competition uh, for properties out there. One of the other statistics from August that's uh, I think is quite notable is that um, the properties marketed on ESPC in Edinburgh, Lothians, Fife and the Borders, of all of these, 93.7% were priced as offers over um, compared to 79.3% last year. Um, that's uh, quite significant just due to the fact that offers over, um, for any of you that have bought a property in Scotland, you'll, you'll probably be aware of it, this, but is generally an invite to buyers to 
bid over the asking price, sometimes quite significantly over the asking price, and generally opting to use offers over as opposed to some of the other pricing terms such as fixed price or offers in the region of does tend to suggest that agents and sellers have confidence in the current market conditions that the property will get um, some good offers in. Um, so and similarly the average asking price in august was also up year on year so in august 2020 the average asking price of properties in edinburgh lillian's fife and the borders on espc was just over 250,000 compared to just over 232,000 last year so we've also seen a bit of a jump in that so i guess to summarize in august we're seeing still seeing very high levels of activity um, and we are seeing evidence um, of there being quite a competitive market for buyers but we're seeing a lot more homes coming to market so it does generally suggest there's a bit more choice on the market for buyers as well um, so i think that's kind of a, a brief overview just so you have a picture of what what's been going on and what i'll do now is pass back to will so he can start the q a part of the event thank you much for that claire um it's very interesting um, so yeah, I'm going to go into Q&A now. Um, I've noticed some guys are already using the Q&A button as well. So your question might already be asked throughout, but um, what we'll do is at the end of this, like I said, I'll go into the Q&A box and have a look and see uh, what questions are there as well. So um, let me just bring up the questions now. Um, so uh, the first question is for Andrew. Um, it is, should I wait to buy until the new year and are prices going to cool soon? Uh, thanks, Will. Uh, it's a good question. Um, the honest answer to that is nobody knows at the moment. Um, we can only really look at the market we've got at the moment and make an assessment on that. And it is a pretty robust market. Even the underlying market, I think, is pretty robust and pretty strong. Um, there's been a wave of pent up demand from buyers and sellers when nothing very much happened for three months during lockdown, which and, and you have, we have to kind of wait till that's all washed through to get a feel for what is what the true underlying market is, I think. Um, but our feeling is that, my feeling certainly is that what's there is pretty strong. There are lots of buyers around. Um, there's plenty of money around in general terms. Banks are, I'll leave this one to Paul later on, but banks generally are still lending. Um, you need to remember, of course, this post we are in a recession. So recession is quite different to, for example, the financial crash. Um, this is something where the, the, the economic experts are all saying we're going to go into very, we've gone into very quickly, but hope we should come back out of. You hear all this chat about the V-shaped recession, um, and not only the, the banks are in a very, very different position in terms of their capitalisation to the um, to, during the financial crisis, they're also under a lot of political pressure to, to continue to lend. So it, it's a very different situation to to that, for example. Um, this is also a market that, bear in mind, has been through Brexit, IndyRef, um, and has proved to be robust through all of those. Um, to my mind, it would actually be, even though there's a lot of macroeconomic stuff still to wash through, um, and we don't quite know what's going to happen, there are inevitably going to be job losses when the furlough scheme comes to an end, that kind of thing. Um, but to my mind, it would be it would be strange if the market were to suddenly change or were to fall off a cliff um, on the back end of hopefully the back what's the saying the back end hopefully the back end of COVID when in actual fact it's a market that's been robust through you know once in a lifetime normally yeah. political experiences um, but in all honesty nobody knows but it does feel like that as if the under, underlying market is pretty robust. No, that's an excellent answer. And yeah, I think it is, it is one of those, you know, I think we, we spoke about this uh, before with the, the, the crystal ball. It's it's kind of, you would, we would love to know, but um, like you said, by all indications, it's it does look like a strong, um, robust market. Okay, so next one is for Paul. Um, this is, do you think the norm of 15% mortgages will stay for some time? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Will. Good, very good question. Uh, yes, I do believe that 50% uh, deposit mortgages are here to stay for a while. Can't put an exact time frame on it, but I do believe till at least the end of the year. Um, lenders are very cautious just now. They are lending, as uh, Andrew mentioned earlier, um, but at 15% deposit. Um, the difficult thing is that from time to time, um, lenders do pop in and out of the 90% market where you need a 10% mortgage, uh, but it is actually very few and far between uh, in that happening. Um, one advantage, I suppose, of, of uh, having a 
uh, deposit is that the, your interest rate is um, slightly better than having a five or 10% um, deposit. Um, so yeah, an answer to the question, I would suggest that till the end of the year at least anyway, 15%, uh, possibly even into next year. And then who knows, it's a very difficult sort of question to sort of give a definitive answer on, but that's my, um, that's my view and uh, personal view on it. That's perfect, thank you very much. Um, okay, so next one is for Andrew. Uh, is this a buyer's or seller's market at the moment? So I'll leave that one with you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a, another nice narrow question for me there. Well, thanks. Um, I, I think over the piece, I think generally speaking, I would say it's a seller's market. Um, if I was, if I had to go one way or another, the, the reason for that is the the majority of good quality properties properly marketed, by which I mean in the right places like ESPC and at the right price. Um, there are multiple purchasers for most of these properties. A lot of them are, as Claire said earlier on, are selling at closing day, often for significant pre with significant premiums being paid by buyers. Um, and in very general terms, there are more buyers around than there are sellers. Um, that said, I would, I would say I would caveat that slightly by saying it's not all bad news for purchasers. Um, my feeling about it, uh, about this is that uh, post lockdown, there's been a much better supply of properties coming to the market than there was pre lockdown. Um, pre lockdown, there were a lot of, bear in mind, this is not true of everyone, but a lot of buyers are also sellers, and a lot of sellers are also buyers. And one, one without one, I'll either a purchase or sale without the other is no use to those, to those buyers and sellers. Um, there was a, a bit of an issue pre-lockdown where people were worried, people who were prospective sellers were worried about, but not about the sale end of things, about the purchase end of things. Therefore, there were a lot of offers being submitted subject to sale. And those properties, the properties owned by those people were not coming to market. And it becomes a bit of a vicious circle where properties just weren't seeing the market and that were not available to buyers. Um, my feeling is that's happening less post-lockdown. There has been a better supply. I think that's uh, Claire can will be able to back that up with some ESPC numbers um, in terms of the supply that's there for for buyers. It feels a bit freer, so it's it's not all bad news. But over the piece, it's still pretty competitive, and there are still multiple purchasers for most properties. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question is for Claire. Uh, is it common to have high numbers of attending viewings? Attendees viewing viewings at the moment. Um, so I'll pass that across to you. Yeah, of course. So obviously I mentioned earlier that the number we're seeing a sort of record high number of viewing requests on ESPC. The last few months uh, we've seen massive numbers of people um, booking in viewings. Obviously the new guidelines mean that open viewings aren't permitted, um, obviously to protect public health and safety during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so that's sort of changed things a bit for agents who are now having to get appointment only systems in place, uh, whereas before they would have been able to invite multiple interested buyers to an open viewing. Um, so obviously that means that there, um, there are a lot of people requesting viewings for different properties. So there might be kind of a backlog for some popular properties, um, but obviously at each viewing and at, at each viewing, they can only, they have a limitation on really how many people should be there. So it's on, only from the one household and ideally as few people from that household as possible. Um, so, so at each individual viewing, um, there won't be, obviously won't be many people, but there's, they're all booked in by appointment now. So there might be quite a backlog. So there's a lot of people looking to view properties uh, by appoint on an appointment basis. And um, for those that are um, obviously like trying to view properties at the moment, obviously as well, um, the government guidance does advise an online first approach. So do as much research about the property online before you do choose to view it. And um, if there's a virtual viewing available um, that you can use, make use of that as well. Um, and also um, information in the home report and the images and the description online as well. Thank you very much. Um, so back to Andrew for the next one. Um, what are the costs associated with selling and are there any costs that agents won't mention? Thanks, well, um, uh, the, the answer to deal with the second part of that first, there shouldn't be any selling costs that agents won't mention. Um, everything, if you ask a, an agent to provide you with a, an estimate of the costs of the sale, um, everything should be disclosed. There's no 
no reason why they wouldn't be. And I would expect any ESPC agent to any ESPC member firm um, to, to provide full transparent costs. Um, I think the, the, the main thing with this probably is if you're looking at costs from different agents, make sure you are comparing like with like. The one thing agents will do is they will present the costs slightly differently and they each present them in their own way. Um, for example, make sure if you're looking at estate agency and conveyancing, make sure you're separating these things out. Some agents will present them together. Some will present them as two separate sets of costs. Um, again, just make sure you're, you're not looking at an estate agency only set of costs and comparing it with something that includes the conveyancing and then wondering, thinking you're getting a great deal, but in actual fact, you've still got the conveyancing cost to factor in. Um, on the agency side, estate agency side, the, the main outlays you're going to have are going to be for photos, floor plans, um, your ESPC registration. Um, if you want to market your property and get it, all, get it into all the, all the right and best places, you definitely need one of those. Um, the, the one variable, again, in terms of how people will tend to present this is probably with the home report. Um, some agents will show that as a cost. Um, others will not for the simple reason that it is, it's, it's very often something that is paid directly by the seller to the surveyor I mean, even though it will often be arranged by the, the selling agent the actual cost and the actual payment is made direct to the surveyor so some agents won't show that um, in, in the costings again just make sure there is a home report included somewhere in your in your calculations um, again you just want to make sure that you are comparing like with like and, and being able to do a genuine comparison um, I think probably the final thing I'd say on costs is just also bear in mind that the, the, the pure bottom line cost here is not the be all and end all. Um, really what you should be looking for when you're trying to appoint an agent is somebody who is going to get you the best price and do the job that you want done in relation to your sale. Um, the, the discrepancy between uh, the, the, the prices achieved by a good agent marketing your property well and a bad agent marketing your property badly can be many percentage points um, and you know as we've seen even just with the, the ESPC the data between you know in terms of the, uh, the ESP get more um, campaign we all know we all know about um, it's, it's been proven that you, an, an average ESPC agent will get about three percent more than the average non-ESPC agent for the same property. So um, yes, costs are important, but they're not the be all and end all. Um, you would much rather be paying a wee bit more from a much bigger pot of money for your property, I would imagine, um, than paying very little, but not getting the right return. It's a, it, it can be a false economy if you're not, not to choose the right agent for the job. Absolutely, I think that's, yeah, you, you, you know, buy or sign a house will be probably the, one of the biggest transactions of your entire life. So you you do want the best person for the job. Um, and like you said, like you mentioned, the ESPC, uh, we, you know, we did some research and yeah, we proved that our agents do get 3% more on average. Um, thank you for that, Andrew. Um, Okie dokie, uh, this one going back to Paul. Uh, what assistance is available for first time buyers with regards to mortgages? Yeah, that's another very good question. Um, there are a few schemes available for first time buyers. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of, of three of them. Uh, the first one is Help to Buy Scotland, where you um, can buy a property on, on a new build property only up to 200,000 and you get 15% deposit. Um, but you must have a minimum of 5% deposit of your own savings or from a gifted deposit from family or um, family members or um, brothers, sisters, parents, people, people of that nature. The other one is LIFT, L-I-F-T. Um, this is where, as another scheme, where you get between 10 and 40% uh, deposit um, from, from the, um, the government again. Um, and the, there's a few restrictions with this one. One of them is that um, the purchase price or purchase prices, sorry, depending which area of Scotland you're in, are restricted in relation to the number of bedrooms. Okay. The the most common scheme that's available just now is called this the the first Scottish Minister's First Home Fund, where you get up to 25% deposit to use uh, towards your, uh, for a first time buyer to use towards their, the purchase of the property. And um, you can only use it 
excuse me, for the deposit, you can't use it for um, anything like fees or, or land tax or anything of that, anything of that nature. Um, for all these schemes, you must have 5% um, deposit of your own funds, either from family gifts or from savings. All these schemes, um, the basics of the schemes anyway, are all available to, to view on our website. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm a first-time buyer, so I find that quite interesting as well. Um, and the ESPC uh, mortgages website is very good. It's got a lot of good information there. Um, if you are looking for um, more on that, okie dokie. Uh, going back to Andrew. Sorry, we've given you lots of questions. Um, how do you think the LBTT changes will affect the Edinburgh market? Um, the honest answer to that is I don't think they make a massive difference one way or another. My personal view has always been that um, land and building transactions is a fairly blunt instrument when it comes to affecting the market. It's something which government over the years have always been quite keen on um, and I've never in all honesty quite seen the, the, the merit of it. Um, uh, as things stuff, if they want to doubt, as things stand just now, the, the nil rate band for um, the only band pre-change was 145,000 for everyone and 175,000 for first-time buyers um, and that's been put up to 250,000 for everyone so effectively for somebody buying somebody buying at 250,000 pounds there's a 2,100 pound saving on the landed building transaction tax just now um, by not paying two percent on the that additional slice get it at no rate instead um, the saving for a first-time buyer, the equivalent saving, is about £1,500. Um, not totally insignificant sums, but in the grand scheme of buying and selling a property in Edinburgh, not massively different. And very often, I think, maybe just giving people a bit more spending power may actually be, if anything, inf slightly inflationary to property prices. Um, I think the one time you do see an effect is, and, and it's not necessarily an effect you would want to see, but you see a slightly distorting effect just as you see something like this coming in, or again, when it goes out, it's due to come to an end, uh, the end of March um, 21. Um, and I think inevitably you will see a rush of activity as people try to um, uh, you know, beat the beat the buzzer um, and get a deal done um, in time to take advantage of the, uh, of, of the benefit that's there. Um, but as for what happens in the middle, I'm, a skeptic, it'd be fair to say, about what what effect it's actually having on the market. Um, in terms of stimulation, my view is this is a market that did not need stimulation in the first place. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so we're going across to Claire now. Um, so if I can find my own question, uh, is it possible to have an offer accepted that is below or above? Uh, basically, it, what, what, is there you know, offers coming in above or below HR um, valuation at the moment? Thanks, Bill. Um, so with, uh, obviously, I sort of mentioned earlier that we're getting anecdotal evidence from agents about the competition for property and therefore uh, offers um, being accepted that are sometimes well in excess of the home report valuation. Um, but really with this kind of, um, with the home report valuation, uh, average percentages and things like that, every property is different and has different circumstances there is obviously in different areas and things as well so um properties will kind of properties will all achieve different offers in terms of how much they achieve in terms of home report valuation um if you're looking if you're hoping to get an offer accepted under the home report valuation again it will just depend on the property uh, the area how much interest is in that property what the circumstances are in terms of selling it so there's a lot of different factors that affect that and it would obviously be a great to just say oh if you bid this exact amount then you will definitely get this property but it's it's a bit, bit more complicated than that and the best thing you can really do for that is to speak to your solicitor Lister about either your sale or your purchase in terms of what, um, like kind of what they think um, is likely, um, and I, but I'm sure Andrew would agree with me that it really just differs for different properties. Yeah, I'm happy to. It's, it's probably the question that's asked. I'm asked most often. Claire is, you know, what is the average percentage? You know, the properties are going for over home report. And it's also the it's, it's the it's the the question I'm least keen to answer because I think it really gives really quite misleading information at times you very much do need to take each case on its own merits um bottom line is what drives prices competition always has been always will be um therefore what happens with a property where there is one interested one purchaser one prospective purchaser or two or three 
prospective purchasers is entirely different to what might happen in a situation where there's a competitive closing date with 8, 10, 12 prospective purchasers and you very much do have to take each case on its merits. If you take all these numbers and put them together, yeah, you will come out with an average figure. But is that average figure actually representative of what's happening in many of the cases? The answer to that, I think, is probably not. So um, I'm, I'm leery about the value of that average figure per se. You very much do need to take, take advice and take each, take each particular property on a bespoke basis. Thanks, guys. That's, that's really good. Um, I think the next question actually is kind of similar. It was what is the average sale time? And that was, this was specifically for Leith. Um, you would you say you could probably apply the same answer to that question there, where it's the the property is the key to the selling time rather than or the, the demand for that type of property. Yeah, I would say um, obviously Leith is a popular area and generally quite high in demand, but it does um, selling times. It's a similar uh, a similar situation where it's very difficult to know exactly how long it will take a property to sell for uh, as. Andrew said it's very dependent on the uh, the amount of interest in the property, the competition for the property, um, and uh, and various other factors as well. So uh, yeah, it's quite a similar situation. But I would say that Leith is generally um, what we've seen is generally it's quite a popular area for a lot of different buyers. But again, best to speak to your solicitor if you are thinking of selling a property there uh, to find out kind of what their thoughts are um, in terms of marketing strategies and stuff like that. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so we'd have a question about, uh, so I'm a cash buyer from England, what do I do? Um, I can probably answer that, uh, is the best thing to do if you are coming from down south or vice versa, I'm going, you know, you would want to speak to a local agent. Um, so someone like Andrew, who would be able to help you out. There are quite big differences, aren't there, Andrew, between the two markets? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, anybody who's coming into, coming into the Scottish system is not familiar with it, um, mm -hmm. any ESPC member yeah. from solicitor will be happy to chat you through how this all works and um, you know what the processes are and, and what the differences are um, it, for people who are cash buyers it's it's not such a big issue you're really just dealing with a system that's a little bit different um, for people who are selling down south that's one to be particularly careful of when you are moving you are selling a property down south and moving north it, it works this works really quite well going north to south but less well coming south to north um, and the reason for that is simply the, the, the difference in the way contracts become legally binding. Mm -hmm. um, concluding missives in Scotland simply means giving you a binding contract for the sale. That tends to happen relatively quickly under the Scottish system. Mm -hmm. Exchanging contracts, um, which is the, the English equivalent of concluding missives, tends to happen much later in the process down south. Um, therefore, the, the, the point of getting contractual certainty tends to happen much earlier with the, in the Scottish system. Um, uh, what that means is if you are trying to buy something, you're moving south to north and the person you're buying from is, is, is looking for a purchaser who has got their own property sold and has got contractual certainty, it might, you might be quite a wee bit down the road um, and, until you as the, the purchaser are in that position and you've got your contracts exchanged. You do need, you need to just be a wee bit cautious about that. Um, if you are, if you do find yourself in that position, I would, I would definitely be, be saying speak to your solicitor, give them all the information, and, and take some advice on that. Just about it's about timing more than anything else. No, thank you. Um, that's a, quite a popular question that one. So I think you know people are looking north; they are always keen to find out more. Um, so the last one from the closed questions uh, is for Claire: uh, is what is the current impacts of cladding? Uh, what are mortgage lenders? Uh, criteria around ESW1 certification, etc. Thanks. Well, um, yes, yeah, so some of you uh, will be aware um, that um, probably the end of, towards the end of last year, uh, lenders started um, uh, being a bit stricter around buildings with cladding um, uh, about their decisions on whether to lend on them or not, um, just due to sort of fire safety um, issues and things like that, uh, both down south and up in Scotland. Um, so what they've now asked for is an EWS1 form, um, which is basically a certificate that it once signed by someone qualified, basically it, it's basically um, almost like an MOT for the building just to sort of say, um, just to provide to the lender so that to, to convince them to lend on it basically. Um, this was uh, brought in probably towards the end of last year and has been used over the last sort of um, 
last sort of six to nine months, um, I guess. Um, in terms of reports from agents and our some of our mortgage advisors, I think generally on the whole, if the EWS one form is completed by a qualified person, lenders are generally then happy to lend on the property. Although I think, Paul, you might have some more, uh, you might want to jump in there with your experience with the lenders. Yeah, and the majority of lenders and my limited experience, because this is a fairly new thing, um, are all okay with the um, EWS one form. There are one or two lenders that still don't like it, and it must be on the actual property, not the whole building. Um, so that is basically the generic rules for this so far. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say, Paul, it's, it's, it's probably going to become more widely accepted. My, my view on this is this is a much bigger problem in certain big cities in England um, than it is, yeah, we have, there, 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 are, there are a number of properties in Edinburgh and other cities in Scotland, other areas in Scotland where this is a problem, but in relative terms, it's a relatively small number of properties. Um, if you think about the problems they've got in London, Manchester, Birmingham, um, with you know, with the sheer number of properties that are affected in this way, and the, the amount of pressure government and lenders are under to get this sorted out by the owners of those properties, um, I think it is something that is likely to get better just as lenders start to get a wee bit more used to this, and it becomes the bit, we, we started off without a norm, and we're just starting to establish a norm, and hopefully before we're too much old, old that it will become old hat, and lenders will be kind of used to it, and the process will be become something that's established and tried and tested. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Absolutely. Excellent. Thanks, guys. So that's the end of the uh, pre-submitted questions. Um, we do have quite a lot of um, ones have come in uh, during. So if we don't get to your question, I'm sorry. Um, some of them I feel may have already been answered in a small way. So um, we'll, we'll just we'll kick off now. Um, the first one is actually for um, rental. Uh, I can from seeing our own the SPC statistics on this, um, we've seen a lot of rental properties come back on the market, um, but also a lot of tenants looking for them. So um, I would say if you're struggling to get a tenant into your property, I would look at um, who is marketing your property, where you're putting it and who's, and who's managing it for you. Um, and the SPC lettings are an excellent, um, uh, we're an excellent team for that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's for the lettings one there. Um, uh, da, da, da. So this is a uh, one for Paul. Um, do you foresee banks withdrawing fifteen percent mortgages, mortgages as they have done with ten percent? Could we be in a situation where buyers are chasing the deposit thresholds as banks expect more and more cash up front? Uh, difficult question to answer. Probably not. I think um, at fifteen percent, I think they've found where they should be in the marketplace for now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really, the, the sort of honest answer is probably not. I think fifteen percent is going to be the new norm, as I mentioned earlier in the in the um, dialogue earlier. Mm -hmm. That until probably the end of the year, possibly even longer than that. I think it might be politically very difficult for banks to back off that position, Paul. If you look at some of the help and support mm. banks have had in times past, um, then I think government is pretty keen that the banks keep the, the credit tap turned on in a reasonable way. I think banks backing off that would, would come under quite a bit of political pressure. There's a lot of bad publicity to come if they back off that position, is my gut feeling. Yeah, I mean, virtually every single lender bar one or two are at 15%. There's a few at 20, but not many. The norm is definitely 15, and I would agree with that as well. Definitely, yeah. Um, so uh, Claire mentioned healthy sellers, market numbers with good interest. Do you know where these buyers are coming from? Uh, are they coming from out with the area? So I think this is a kind of asking about have we noticed a change in people, what they're looking for and also where they're coming from. So with the kind of rise of working from home, et cetera, are people, have you guys noticed at least that there's been more demand for different types of properties? Um, so we don't really have any kind of like specific sort of hard evidence in terms of statistics around this in terms of where the buyers are coming from. Anecdotally, I have heard from a couple of agents, they've seen an increase in buyers from down south. Um, and also I've heard from a few agents that the sort of lockdown restrictions have changed priorities for some buyers. So um, there's a lot, you know, people who are maybe based, were based in a smaller flat in the city or maybe looking for something a bit bigger uh, with space for a home office with its own garden. Um, but again, we don't have a specific kind of 
like hard evidence behind that, but I have heard some anecdotal comments from that. Um, Andrew, I don't know if you've um, experienced either of those things as well. Yeah, I, I, I think there's, I don't think there's any question um, mm -hmm. that, that things, I think a lot of people have a lot of time to think during lockdown and work out what, what it is they want to do going forward and it is, does their current situation suit them. Um, so I think there are a lot of people who are already here are looking at saying, actually, I'm not in quite the right property. It's time to try and find something that suits my needs a little better, whether that's for home working or, or whatever. There were two or three people actually have looked at it, have ended up coming out of lockdown trying to find a new property because they've decided it's time to get a dog. Um, so, you know, <laughs> there's, there's, more, there's more to it than just home working. Mm -hmm. I think there's also, there, there, are, there are definitely also people, re um, I would say mainly um, expats, if that's the right term, um, Scots who have been working away generally who are who are relocating back to Scotland um, either because um, they've looked at the, they've gone through the whole Covid thing and decided it's just time to come home um, and uh, be, be based here um, rather than in I've got people coming from the, the Far East from Australia from the States um, either because they could have done their stint and this was this is this has caused them to draw a line under that stint or in some cases because in actual fact people are looking at it and saying that the amount of traveling they were having to do and the reasons for being located in some of these um, slightly far-flung places are just no longer there to the same extent um, uh, quite a few folk coming from down south um, quite a lot of folk coming from London and from the southeast on that basis um, and generally speaking what you're finding is in actual fact for all it's frog can be a bit wet at times and our summers are maybe not the best. There are still a lot of people who've been away and look at this and think this is a, it's, it's a pretty blooming good little place to live. Mm -hmm. um, so th th there's, th there's a lot of demand and, and uh, there's no, no question that there are people coming from a lot of different places um, to here. And probably also a slight change in what people are looking for. I think that some of the more rural, some of the more urban, uh, some of the more rural um, outlying properties, um, I think there's probably a slightly better demand for those than there has been uh, as well. There's people looking for more outside space um, and again the need to be based in a near an office or in a city centre is maybe not quite as great for some people as it was I don't think there's any doubt about that. Absolutely no. excellent that's, uh, that's brilliant thank you guys. Um, so uh, how subjective are home reports? Can valuations differ a lot between two different valuation companies? Um, that's maybe I don't know if there's any uh, surveyors here but, but uh, Andrew did you have many? Oh, yeah, I'll ha happily take that one. Um, mm. th 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 they are, th there is a degree of subjectivity. It's um, mm. surveying as a, what was it heard it was described as an art, not a science. Um, if you talk to the RICS, which is the governing body for surveyors, they will tell you if you send 10 surveyors out to a property, their surveyors should come back plus or minus 5% of each other. Now, that sounds like a relatively, that sounds like quite a tight band, but if you work it out, that means there's a, a justifiable band for any profit property, which is 10% wide. Um, you, it, it sh you shouldn't be seeing variations beyond that. Um, as I say, it is, there is a matter of opinion it goes into any valuation. Some valuers are known to be slightly more bullish than others. Uh, there's no question about that. What I would say to you is if you're if you're looking at something, if you talk to your solicitor, your, the solicitors know the surveyors. Um, we know the agents as well. Agents don't all price in the same in quite the same way. Um, it, as a purchaser, bear in mind you are probably doing this as a one-off. Um, the solicitor you're going to be talking to this does this all day every day, knows the agents, knows the surveyors, knows who tend to be cautious as surveyors when they come to their valuations, know who tend to be that wee bit more aggressive. Um, and these are all things it, when we were talking earlier on about why you can't take a one size fits all approach um, to purchasing a property or to applying a percentage indeed uh, there's that's another quite significant factor a percentage of what you know if you start off with something that's relatively undervalued maybe a percentage maybe a wee bit higher something that's a bit a bit valued a bit more fully the percentage might be a bit lower you're still getting to the same point for the same property but by a slightly different route Thank you very much. Yeah, I wasn't too sure if we, <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's something that answered that quite fully. Um, so I think we're nearing the end now. Um, there were a few more questions. Some of them uh, were a bit more specific about asking how much they should offer over for a property. I would say it is, like we said earlier, case by case basis. And also if you are looking to purchase up here, maybe speak to an agent who's up here as well. So you, you, you get an idea of, of you know, they'll, they'll know the, the, the market a lot better um, and they'll be able to advise you very specifically on, on kind of, you know, 
what's happening. They'll have the historical sales data. So they'll be able to look back to see how that area is doing, how properties with that, you know, uh, with those uh, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, et cetera, how they do. So um, that's fine there. Um, there's one more, uh, I think I know the answer, but I'll pass across to Andrew. Um, it says, do solicitors commonly charge fees per offer submitted on behalf of their clients? Pretty sure that's a no. Uh, generally speaking, not. Uh, I can't speak for all solicitors. It's, mm -hmm. it, it, it is a matter for each solicitor. Uh, mm -hmm. My own firm, for example, we, as a matter of policy, don't charge for unsuccessful offers. We charge mm -hmm. a fair fee for um, for, a, a, for a successful offer. Mm -hmm. Um, but we tend not to charge for unsuccessful offers. I, I think one of the things that people do sometimes, I think people are generally aware, they understand the bit of the job that the solicitor does in terms of actually doing the legal work and doing the convincing and sorting out the, you know, the loan papers and preparing the security and all that kind of thing. I think, and this can be different to, again, different to the way it sometimes is down south. I think the bit people don't always get is that a lot of what the solicitor does and where a good solicitor will add value is before you ever get an offer accepted. And there can be an awful lot of chatting about property and looking at, you know, looking at situations and trying to help you read situations, um, getting, um, sales data information and just generally chatting through properties that people are interested in and saying okay on an average day i think this is what might happen are you interested do you want to go ahead this is the, this would be our best way of going about trying to get this property for you there could be more work done doing that kind of thing before an offers before an offer is ever accepted than there ever is after after an offer is it is finally accepted um and that's that's fine the, the purchasers need to be able to phone up and chat about properties without feeling they're on the clock every time they pick up the phone to their lawyer. Um, we do this all day, every day. Most purchasers don't. That's what we're there for. Um, so I speak of my own firm. We certainly don't charge for unsuccessful offers. I think you would find most ESPC, ESPC solicitors would say the same. Um, I don't speak for all of them, but the, for the vast majority of them, that will be the case. No, thank you. Um, no, I think well, that's um, all we have time for today. We've gone a little bit over, but everyone actually stuck around. So that's really good. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone uh, for taking time out today. Thank you for coming along. Uh, thank you, Andrew, Paul, and Claire. Um, I thought it was really, really good. Um, lots of good information in there today. We are, we've recorded this, so we are going to put it on YouTube um, afterwards. So if you do want to um, look back through, um, you'll be able to do that as well. Um, and yeah. That's, that's all for today. So just thanks for coming along, guys. Right. I'll see everyone later. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.